Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, Jana Klinger, this is Patrick Wale. We are here from Wuppertal University from Germany uh, and want to talk uh, to you about um, a catalogue of digital scholarly editions. Actually, we discovered today that the title of our talk was wrong. We are not talking about the one catalogue, but about uh, one of a few catalogues of digital scholarly editions. Um, what are we going to do today? Uh, first, we are going to um, answer the question to why have a catalogue of digital scholarly editions in the first place, um, to then um, look at the fourth version of uh, a catalogue of scholarly editions, uh, the catalogue um, started by Patrick Saale in 1997, um, look at its history, its aims, um, the definition used for digital scholarly editions, um, the workflow to discover uh, editions we want to add to the catalogue and um, the content of the catalogue. Then, um, in the third step of our talk, we are going to um, take a glimpse at how the catalogue can be used as a starting point for further research. Okay, so first point is uh, why should we all, why should we have a catalogue on uh, digital scholarly editions and it's uh, obvious and, and quite easy. One of the starting points is uh, assuming you want to create a digital edition and many people want to create digital editions, strangely. Uh, what do you, would you need uh, to know? Of course you would need to know which digital editions are already uh, out there, so it's about uh, giving an overview. You would need to know um, what do the other editions uh, look like. So this gives you some sort of an inspiration for your own um, endeavor or your own uh, project. Then you would uh, need to know what is the methodology that other editions uh, apply. So the, the catalog helps us in um, bringing together a sound theory and practice in the field of digital scholarly uh, editions. Next question would be, what is the current uh, best practice? Um, because one of the major problems, I think, in, in editing is that we all would agree that it would be nice if all editions would look quite similar because that would make them much easier to use and in fact the opposite is the case uh, right now and for the last 25 years or the last 30 years every digital scholar edition, edition looked differently and that's not the best uh, situation that we want uh, to have and so within catalogs are a helpful starting point uh, to answer all these questions ah no um, the real reason uh, why there is a catalogue is not on, on the slide. So the real reason why there is this catalogue or other catalogues is uh, my own personal interest in the field of digital scholarly uh, editing from the times when I was a student. Uh, when I was a student I was interested in editing uh, and so I thought um, if I want to say something valid about digital scholarly editing I first have to know all the digital scholarly editions that there are out there. I mean, that's how scholarship is working, right? And so I started to collect all the editions that are out there to build my own work and finally my own dissertation on it. And then it grew and grew further and the dissertation was handed in, but cataloging uh, did not stop, <laughs> as it's always the case with these projects in the inter on the internet. They never stop. It's like, like children that never leave uh, home. Okay, anyway, so we have a catalog and um, catalogs may be a helping, uh, helpful starting point to answering uh, all these questions. And um, luckily, um, our catalog is not the only catalog, so you are not uh, obliged to use it and you are not restricted to this catalog because there is a second catalog, and that's the catalog of our great uh, colleague uh, Greta Francini from, from Italy, who worked for a longer time in, in England and also in Germany, so she's, uh, she quite came along. Uh, she has another catalog that started in uh, 2016. As Jana said, our version number four is younger than that catalog because it's from 2020, but still, uh, I think we have been the inspiration for her because our older versions are older than her, in her catalog. But that, that is not really uh, of any importance here. Um, there is uh, said to come a third catalog uh, of Digital Scholar Edition um, within a larger infrastructure project in Germany. There is a national research data infrastructure to be built with very much money uh, put in it. And they are going to build another catalog, which will be much better, of course, because there is very much money behind it. And they have, for example, a data model with, I don't know, 50 fields of uh, metadata. So it's really... Uh, ambitious project and we will see 
whether someday something uh, will come out of it or not. Uh, if not, you still have these two uh, catalogs. Yeah, so um, now we can take a, a look at the uh, fourth version of the catalog, actually. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, well, we are going to try and make some short live uh, yeah. session. Let's see. So, um, this is the fourth version of the catalog. Um, the, it's possible to, to, to filter um, across different categories um, on the sidebar. Um, the entries are very short. There's the possibility to click on this more thing here. And then there's a short text snippet um, taken mostly from the editions themselves uh, that describes uh, what, what they are all about, and uh, then if you click on, on this um, blue um, thing, then you are led directly to the edition, so um, yeah, it's very easy to, to access the editions directly from the catalog, and um, yeah, that's about it, I guess. Oops, wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Okay, some words on the history, where does it all uh, come from? As I already said, um, this is the fourth iteration of uh, <coughs> things that we have done before, dating back uh, until 1997, as I looked it up <laughs> recently. So we are at version number four, and now we have a rather sustainable workflow. We now uh, encode the knowledge that we have in TIP5, of course, and we maintain a GitLab repository to do so and uh, keep it updated and then we have an automatic uh, publication uh, workflow attached to that GitLab repository that is a TI publisher instance that takes uh, the data from the repository and updates uh, the application every time a record is changed or a new record uh, is created. Uh, one of the particular things about this project is um, that it's not a project uh, so it, it has never been funded, uh, it's purely private and it's a purely uh, voluntary in endeavor. In this uh, sense, I think it's quite interesting how far you can get without any money, let's say, <laughs> if, if only you want to and if only you persist. Um, and then saying no money, that's of course also a lie, uh, because uh, Jana Klinger and after her graduation, Leonard uh, Rutzel, have received some funding from some overheads from some other projects that we, we uh, were able to get a funding for. In this case, we have a, a funded graduate school in Wuppertal on digital scholarly editing or on, on, on scholarly editing, to be more precise. And when you get a lot of money in Germany to do a research project, you get additional overhead money which you can use for other purposes. And so we used some money from that project uh, to finance uh, Jana and Leonard to do the, the actual uh, cataloging work throughout the last um, five years. And uh, the, the icon uh, on the bottom, that's Leonard. Uh, I didn't want to put a, a real uh, realistic <laughs> photograph in there uh, besides all the other uh, <laughs> logos and icons. So I, I had uh, ChatGPT create uh, an icon <laughs> from a real photograph from, from her, but for him, but it's, it's quite, uh, quite telling, so he really looks like uh, that. <laughs> and all the other uh, icons and logos you know, except for maybe the, uh, the uppermost um, one, only very, very old people in the room may remember what that is. That was a logo uh, for a so-called virtual library. In the mid-19s, in the beginning of the World Wide Web, there was the idea uh, of people coming from the library world that we should catalog everything, every resource on the internet manually. What a strange idea nowadays. And that was a logo for that endeavor to, to uh, divide the whole world of knowledge. There is history, there is literature, and then there is editing, and every uh, catalog had this logo uh, on, on its website, and so this is uh, really uh, very, very far away now. Okay. Yeah, uh, what are the aims of the catalog? Um, the first and foremost is the always unattainable goal uh, to give a complete overview of the field of uh, scholarly, digital scholarly editing. Um, the 
maybe more realistic goals that um, uh, that come with that are that there should be quick orientation uh, in the field of scholarly editing. Uh, it should be possible to uh, find inspiring examples if you ever uh, want to create your own DSE. Um, it's supposed to document the interdisciplinary state of the art in edit editing to uh, facilitate the increasing convergence amongst editions and to allow for research of the historical development of DSEs. Um, and attaining those goals um, when cataloging with uh, over a very long period of time, we, uh, where we heard already the catalog is now 27 years in the making, um, in a collaborative work setting with uh, different people doing the cataloging over this uh, 27 years, then um, there comes the challenge to, to curate a consistent database um, to reach all of these aims. And, that can only be done with a um, clear definition of what a DSE actually is, which is going to be the next point. Exactly. So if, if consistency over a long period of time, 27 years, maybe 30 years, maybe 40 years, is the goal, then of course uh, the backbone of it all is, is a strict and stable, uh, let's say, definition of what we really want to catalog. So what is really a digital scholarly edition, and I have written uh, about this topic elsewhere, so I don't have to uh, repeat it here, uh, and it comes down to the simple sentence, scholarly editing is a critical representation of historical uh, documents. And of course, all of these words need to be explained uh, further, and of, they are uh, purposefully uh, left somehow vague because they have to be filled. Anyway, so uh, the problem we have, or the challenge we have, is with every new candidate that we see or that are shown to us, it is shown to us, uh, we have to, to think about and decide whether Candidate X really is a digital scholarly edition in the sense of our um, definition. And um, while in most cases that's quite straightforward and easy, there are many cases, borderline cases, where we start discussing. That is uh, discussing amongst us and with Leonard now, and then we have uh, another third man in the back uh, with, with whom we discuss this, and we'll come back on that later on. So there is sometimes, there, is, there are discussions. Is this really additional scholarly editions that we have to catalog, or would we like to leave it out? And then we, we always have the same um, items to, to discuss, and these are often, um, are the documents or text fully represented uh, and not just described? So if something does not completely represent its object, then it cannot be a digital uh, scholarly edition. Uh, that's one of the most important things. The other most important thing is uh, the critical engagement. So without criticism, textual criticism, historical criticism, it cannot be um, a digital scholarly edition. And often you can see whether there is uh, this critical engagement by just looking whether uh, there is an editorial statement. So I would just say, for example, it has been true also for, for printed editions. If the edition doesn't have a foreword, then it's not a scholarly endeavor. <laughs> Cannot be. So if, if you don't make your own methodology transparent, then there is no methodology. Yeah, there is an implicit methodology, but that's not how it works. Okay. Um, we do regard the self-understanding of the project. We, we would not have to do that, because we have our own def definition. We can decide from, from the outside whether this is an edition or not, but we do take into account the self-understanding of an edition. So if an edition calls itself, I am the critical scholarly edition, then we take that seriously and say, okay, maybe they have reasons uh, for that claim and we have to take a closer look into that. On the other hand, many scholarly editions in the catalogs do not call themselves scholarly digital editions. For example, many of them call themselves uh, critical archive, for example. In these cases, um, we feel free to override their own uh, understanding and would say, yes, you call yourself an archive, but we would say you are as well a digital scholarly edition. So in that case, uh, yeah, we take our own uh, liberty and, and not uh, only follow their self-understanding. Um, there are some, some border lines which we uh, use very often to decide, and, and one of these lines is um, that we catalog um, editions not projects. In many cases, we are approached by people getting funding for doing an edition. 
And then in, in these phases of their work, initial phases, they are most active <laughs> and have a high interest in being catalogued. And they would approach us and tell us, well, I have a great uh, edition coming up here. Could you please catalog that? And it's always a very bad, uh, slightly embarrassing situation when we say, well, sorry, but this is only a project. It's not an edition. So we will only catalog that when there is something already there, more than a plan, let's say. So there must, we would always say there must be a substantial content or um, the edition must be already usable or reviewable. Then we would catalog uh, them. And other borders, uh, border lines to other fields, of course, are uh, digital libraries, which often don't show a critical engagement with individual text, digital archives, which don't have sometimes textual criticism, or text collections. So in an ideal world, we would have uh, catalogs on digital libraries, digital archives, and digital text collections. And then it would be much easier to say, well, we don't catalog this, but you could go to that catalog. That would be a perfect uh, world, so to say. Yeah, so uh, how do we go about to, um, to catalog the editions? Um, first, we can only catalog the resources that we know about. Um, and we are always happy to receive hints from, from the communi community. So if uh, you ever come across uh, any edition, uh, then feel free to tell us and we're going to take a closer look. Um, right now, our uh, top informant for um, uh, scholarly editions is uh, Professor Dr. Georg Vogler from the University of Graz. Um, I think he's like responsible for about 80% uh, of everything we add nowadays to the catalog. Um, then uh, we also sometimes cross-check with the uh, catalog from uh, Greta Francini and with the uh, reviews um, of digital scholarly editions. Um, yeah, and we keep an eye on the ongoing developments ourselves, uh, which always leaves uh, the problem of attention, attendance bias. Um, well, pro uh, obviously, we are going to be overrepresenting editions from traditional genre genres from uh, Western countries, because that's the realm we are uh, moving in, so um, yeah, with this presentation we also hope to just raise the awareness uh, that there is this catalogue and to encourage active contributions uh, from within the field. Okay, I think I can speed up a little bit here, uh, because this is only descriptive uh, numbers. We are now at uh, 845 uh, editions, which range from 1988 to 2024 as the first year of, of, of being uh, published. The other uh, criteria you have already seen, there is only one interesting point maybe on that, that slide. Uh, the question, uh, is the catalog the answer to the question how many digital scholarly editions are out there? And the answer is uh, sadly no. Because uh, on the upper right corner you see um, uh, the disclaimer or the caveat uh, that there are edition platforms out there and, and in one, at one certain uh, point in time we decided um, that if we have an edition platform where you have 50 different editions, we would not catalog all the 50 editions uh, individually but only maybe one, two, three, four, five of them for a methodological reason. And so the, the answer uh, to the question how many uh, digital scholarly editions are out there in the world is 845 plus those on uh, edition platforms that are not catalogued individually. And uh, it's sometimes uh, in, in the night when I cannot sleep, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe we should change that and yes, catalog all single uh, editions. It would be doable still, and then we would end up at, I don't know, 950 or something like that. So it would be doable. Yeah, here uh, are some uh, visualizations of the uh, data from the catalog um, in, I don't know, can I, yeah. Uh, here you can see uh, the different uh, historical periods um, the editions are from, uh, like antiquity and uh, and the early Middle Ages are here, and then high Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, early modern times and modern times. Um, there's really no surprises there that um, the closer we come to the present, the more editions uh, there are. Um, then here you can see um, the number of editions uh, by um, year of launching the uh, editions. And we are not so sure why, why it goes down here uh, towards the end, if we are just getting lazy or 
uh, there are some other reasons. Um, and uh, this is um, a diagram uh, of the different kinds of texts that are um, um, in, in the catalog. So this uh, orange uh, part are um, different uh, kinds of work-oriented uh, scholarly editions. Then the blue ones uh, are um, materially oriented scholarly editions and the green ones are text type oriented. Okay, why do we do that? Uh, because we want to support ongoing research in that field because that's, that's, that's the last slide. <laughs> um, and, and that's the last, that's the final purpose of the whole catalog to, to uh, yeah, trigger or inside of foster um, research in the topic of digital um, scholarly edition. So we think that the catalog is a useful uh, starting point when you are researching uh, digital scholarly editions uh, in a certain field or the historical and methodological uh, development or the current best practices or if you are interested in single methodological issues. We have uh, brought two examples uh, for research that is based on the catalog. One is a thing that is already published uh, some years ago, Roman Bleier, how to cite this digital uh, edition. And he took the catalog as a starting point and went through many, 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 many of, of the catalog entries to check uh, on the citation practice nowadays uh, when it comes to digital scholarly editing. And then more important uh, is an ongoing project in, uh, at the University of Verona. So please get in contact with uh, Anna Capellotto or Raffaele Cioffi uh, if you are also interested in accessibility and inclusion in digital scholarly editing. And they also use the catalog as the empirical basis uh, for this question. And other questions that you could be interested in and then you could use the catalog to, to follow that uh, direction would be the question, how are facsimiles used in scholarly editions? Uh, what's the development in, when it comes to persistent identifiers, which is the basis for citation, of course? How is the apparatus uh, used nowadays in editing? What are the application programming interface uh, practices doing? Uh, how do people deal with, with uh, the practice of annotation in editing? Uh, what is the social uh, configuration, the changing social configuration in the field of scholarly editing when it comes to editorial roles? What about named entities? What about the fate of the commentary from, from the print world to the digital world? What data formats uh, are used? And which technologies lie behind um, the editions? And what about user interfaces and user experience? All these are current uh, open questions in the field of scholarly editing that you could follow by using the catalog as an empirical base, but this is only maybe a first start for further discussing uh, what we have presented here. Thank you very much.